Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is EE380, Stanford University, in the spring of 2022. Um, the uh, talk today is uh, about converged AI and, and HPC. It's a hardware and software approach using Grok's tensor screening uh, processor. Uh, this is uh, an fascinating and interesting talk. I've read a couple of papers about it, and I think we're in for a, for a, a great ride. Uh, the speaker is the uh, uh, principal architect at uh, Grok, and uh, he was previously at uh, uh, Google and before that at Cray. He's a graduate of the United University of Minnesota um, and um, a uh, highly respected and uh, very productive uh, uh, producer of uh, new parts and architectures. Uh, he has a great first name, by the way. It's Dennis. We share that. And uh, now I'm going to share my screen with him. <laughs> and uh, we'll see what happens. Dennis, you're on. Thank you very much for doing this. OK, thank you, Dennis, for that nice introduction. I'm uh, glad to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, today's talk is about converged AI and HPC. And it's really a, an, an introduction to both the chip microarchitecture and the system architecture as we scale from chips to systems and be able to describe some of the work that we've done in the past several years. And as we uh, launch our new uh, set of processors in the market, uh, to kind of describe what we're doing and why we did it, kind of describe the motivation so that people get a sense for uh, why we made the trade-offs that we did. As Dennis mentioned, my name is Dennis Atz. I'm the chief architect and uh, fellow at Grok. I've uh, been at Grok for, for a few years, and uh, I met uh, Jonathan Ross, the founder, at well, my uh, tenure at Google. I spent uh, uh, about a decade at Google building data center networks, um, focusing a lot on energy proportional networks, as well as uh, very scalable cluster architectures. Uh, prior to that, as Dennis alluded to, I was uh, a chief architect at Cray, where I was uh, worked on several top 500 machines and uh, brought to bear a lot of the uh, distributed shared memory and what became to know as, as a dragonfly topology that, that is currently kind of used in a, a number of state-of-the-art top 500 machines. <clears throat> This talk is also uh, prepared with uh, Oscar Menzer, so I want to thank Oscar for all the help, uh, especially this week as I was a little bit under the weather. He was uh, very, very helpful in pulling this all together. What I'm hoping to do is use this as a little bit of a retrospective to give a little bit of our uh, past work from ISCA 2020, where we introduced the, the chip microarchitecture to describe uh, the the uh, deep learning accelerator that we built called the tensor streaming processor. And then uh, this, this ISCA coming up here in the next month, we'll be releasing a new paper that describes our system architecture. It's called a software defined tensor streaming multiprocessor for large scale machine learning. And that's a fairly descriptive title. So you can get a picture of what it, what it entails, but it's really these two papers kind of uh, it, it elucidate both the chip microarchitecture and the system architecture. So I'm hoping that you will uh, be encouraged to go and read those papers to dive in for more details. And if you're really encouraged to come and talk to us because we are hiring and there's lots of interesting work to do. So I um, want to just stop and, and take a step back and in a nutshell describe what Grok does. We, uh, we're a nascent company. We've been around for the last six years. Uh, our flagship product is, is, as I mentioned, the tensor streaming processor and the compiler, a parallelizing compiler that goes along with that. And we'll talk a lot about the hardware software trade-offs that go into building a large scale machine like this. Like I said, we're a relatively small company. We've got around 250 employees and we're growing every day. And I would invite each of you to take a look at the Grok homepage so you can see if there's anything that would be uh, conducive or fit what you're looking to do. Uh, Grok is a, a, uh, uh, a spread kind of all across the, the country and across the world. We've got offices in uh, London as part of our acquisition of the Max Eller uh, acquisition, as well as all over um, the United States and Toronto. We have a large uh, facility in Toronto uh, where a lot of our compiler engineers uh, operate out of. And of course, our headquarters are in Mountain View, California. <clears throat> 
We are uh, remote uh, first, so if you if you embrace and like the hybrid working environment, we certainly embrace that at Grok, and um, I would encourage you to take a look. So part of this, I want to give you a, a little bit of a, a background and maybe uh, motivate some of this talk by by describing some of the work that that really happened several decades ago. And in fact, uh, I would say we're at some of, somewhat of a renaissance in, in computer architecture and that old ideas are now new again in some respects. And um, there are several ideas in here that are inspired by uh, the Cray One and inspired by other machines that are literally decades old, but, but their time is, is come and the killer app is now uh, machine learning. And so these domain spef specific accelerators are like a new generation that's building on uh, some of this prior work. And like I said, the 1980s spawned some really fascinating work that was driven by uh, data flow. And in particular, uh, there were some fascinating machines and the J machine, I've got the, a picture here of a 1024 processor element J machine uh, that was um, from, from MIT, one of the inspirational machines. And it was really uh, founded on, on some, some inspirational work that Jack Dennis did around data flow architecture. And it was based on this idea that you could represent programs as a collection of nodes that are the operators, like plus, minus, multiply, and so forth, and the arcs or the edges connecting those nodes is the operands that are feeding those operands and results. And so as a result, you can compose uh, a function a function, uh, for example, a binary function that consists of two inputs, x and y, and some of those, uh, those inputs have tokens on them, and that's the data operands as they arrive. And there's a fundamental idea in data flow, and that is that the inputs, as the inputs arrive, your, your operator can fire only when its inputs are available. Okay, so the idea here is to try to expose as much natural concurrency, instruction level concurrency, as you can, as you construct a program graph. And so the program was represented as a computation graph or a program graph, and it really represented kind of from the inputs to the outputs, what was being computed and their data dependence relationships. In other words, what had to be done prior in order for these other things to be satisfied. So in effect, you, you built this nice graph and that graph uh, was very composable in that uh, you can build more elaborate graphs by chaining things together. And this idea really allows you to try to expose instruction level parallelism. Now, if you look at this simple example, for instance, instruction level parallelism in this case is any, any siblings, that is things that are operators that are on the same level can be executed concurrently. So it gives you a very natural way of exposing that concurrency and exploiting it. A nice way I like to think about this is if you were to think about your computation graph, whether that's TensorFlow or an Onyx graph or any other program graph that lists and respects the dependencies, if you were to pick it up at the output and kind of dangle it so that all of your inputs are dangling there, you would, you would nicely, the length of that program essentially gives you your execution time and you very nicely get a order of relation, the order of operators that need to be conducted to respect that data dependence. And it gives you all the things that can be done concurrently, i.e. those things that are at the same level. So in this way, it gives you a nice representation of all the instruction level parallelism that can be exposed. And one of the interesting things about this is it came about, these machines didn't ultimately didn't really have the concept of a, of a, a program counter per se, because programs were represented slightly differently. They were represented uh, by this notion of a graph. Now, obviously we're fetching and executing instructions. So the execution model was very simple. You fetch instructions, you execute those instructions when their operands arrive, you update the state, you fetch new instructions. And so there's this kind of very simple execution cycle that was used in this, this simple data flow execution model. And it really, emphasizes, I think for the first time, it really emphasizes that communication and computation are two sides of the same coin. And by that, I mean, if you're going to compute something, it is usually done with the intent of communicating that so that somebody downstream, a, a, an eventual consumer could use that data 
in a way, in a productive way, and compute with it. So it, it spawned a whole new set of kind of uh, aha moments for computer architects as they took this to the next level. For example, Berkeley Active Messages. I like to, to, to look at that and say Berkeley Active Messages was kind of the idea to carry this to a network of workstations idea where you have messages flowing on the network and they're going to spawn uh, new, new messages. And so this, this whole idea kind of quickly mushroomed and created new, new architectures in the 80s and, and early 90s that uh, really have, have come to be influential in today's uh, uh, domain-specific architectures. So if we take this simple model and we just extend it and we include an interconnection network. Now, the interconnection network is kind of a, a nebulous uh, topology agnostic way of representing that we have some collection of processing elements and they're going to be consuming those, those uh, consuming tokens or data operands and producing new results. And those results are going to flow on the network along with the operands. And so the inter interconnection network is really a fundamental part of all these processing elements, whether it's on the same chip or whether it's off the chip. It's a fundamental part of this execution model. So what I hope to, to describe today is a really a, a very different approach that we took. And that's really a, a software defined approach. And by that, I mean, we very carefully laid out the hardware software interface so that we have an ISA that is about, um, it, it's about controlling the underlying hardware. Most instruction set architectures are designed to abstract away the details underneath the heart in, in, of the underlying hardware. For example, on an x86, you may execute a load effective address instruction. Well, you don't, what you don't see is all the implicit messages and the cache moving in the cache movements and all the implicit data movements that get uh, orchestrated as a result of executing that. In other words, often they get broken down into little micro operations that orchestrated together as an ensemble to accomplish some larger goal. And so that is going to be one of the themes today. We're going to talk a little bit about that, of how we've decomposed or disaggregated our functional units so that we can break things up into smaller micro operations that we can execute efficiently. Along with that hardware software interface is a, st a static and dynamic interface. In other words, we have a runtime system that is going to be used for um, actually in placing the, the, the collateral and placing your object files on the machine and then invoking the actual uh, parallel application, as well as handling exceptions. We'll talk a little bit about exception handling as well. And in this regime, nodes in the computation graph represent the operators, just as we did, we talked about in the traditional data flow. And the uh, edges represent results, and those fire only when their input operands are available. And this turns out to be a very conducive model for machine learning. And machine learning, many machine learning models are known a priori. This, it's a static compute graph. And you're taking that static compute graph and you're compiling it for the underlying hardware. Like I said, the, the, the goal here is to expose the, the controls so that the compiler, or most notably the compiler writer, has complete control of the underlying hardware. And that was one of the goals of of the, the ISA was turning over and, and exerting control over the underlying hardware, not abstracting it away, but making it practical for the hardware to compile or to, to compile for it. So that, that required some design philosophy and some, some perspective change from our, from our perspective, because one of the things that we wanted to do is make a completely deterministic chip so that the compiler had omniscient information about where everything was on the chip. For example, um, we allocate tensors on the chip. The compiler will know exactly where those are in the SRAM, as well as which functional units are currently busy on a cycle by cycle basis. In other words, the compiler literally can track the state, the architecturally visible state on a cycle by cycle basis. And you might think, well, that makes it a lot harder <laughs> to build a compiler. But the reality is, by turning over control to the compiler, it's managing more meta state, more architecturally visible state, but it has complete information about the state of the machine. 
And it can now use that to reason about correctness, for example, memory consistency and memory ordering, things like that. And it, it can reason about program correctness now in a way that allows uh, the compiler to build, uh, build a program efficiently. So part of this was we had to embrace this concept of determinism and make sure we did not do anything in the hardware that would reorder events. For example, there's no out of order execution. There's no caches. We don't have traditional caches. Uh, we have no arbiters. This is the 14th chip that I've designed and worked on in my career. And this is the first one that doesn't have any arbiters. Uh, and by arbiters, I mean, it's a crossbar where you're presenting some data to it and it's going to uh, arbitrate and grant one of those inputs an output port, for example. Uh, there's other reactive components. For example, link layer uh, replay. Uh, the PCIe point-to-point -point network uses a link layer protocol to replay any retransmissions that happen. And of course, that interferes with determinism. So we had to embrace forward error correction on our data paths. And we had to account for all that and when we designed the system, both at the chip level and at the system level. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, those specific trade-offs. So the way that to look at this is we want to turn over control of the hardware so that the, the compiler can have this uh, screen programming model. It's a producer-consumer screen programming model, which just means that we have this concept of a screen register instead of a normal general purpose register, we've got this concept of a screen register. And I'll, I'll describe that in much more detail as we, uh, as we go, because it's a, central, it's a central concept and it's a central hardware stru structure. And, and the compiler can track the state of the screen registers on the chip and know exactly where everything uh, is located. So imagine waking up in the morning and this is what your morning commute would look like. This is the concept of determinism to your morning commute. Hopefully your morning commute doesn't look quite that busy, but that's an, an example. If you didn't have stoplights as a flow control mechanism, how could you orchestrate your traffic? Well, this is exactly the job of the compiler in this case, is that in that we are gonna turn over um, and, and, do, and change the way we think about the normal uh, CPU. In fact, what we've done is we've avoided some of the complexities that would ordinarily go into a CPU, for example, a lot of the front end dispatching and scheduling that would go into a normal CPU, think of Tomasulo's algorithm, checking for and remapping different registers, shadow registers, all of that goes away. And instead, we're, we're turning some of that complexity to the compiler to deal with that scheduling instead. That's a much more amenable place to deal with that for a variety of reasons. Um, number one, it, it, it offloads some of the, the complexity, the logic complexity. If you look at the, the, uh, the floor plan of the chip, the, the die above, you see there's, it's, a, it's a regular design, but there's a, a number of, of control units on it. If you look at the, the chip on the bottom, it's very, very regular, very structured. And we take advantage of that, and I'll, I'll explain why in a, bit, in a bit more. But it dramatically simplifies the, the, the chip design so that we can focus on the ALUs and the data paths that are driving them so that we can put our foot on the gas, provide a lot of on-chip bandwidth to feed all those hungry data uh, functional units. So one of the things, as I mentioned, uh, often gets in the way in a traditional CPU or GPU is a conventional memory hierarchy. So for example, we don't have a, a, uh, a memory hierarchy. What we have is a single level uh, SRAM that is organized as a flat memory, a large 220 megabyte, uh, I want to say cache, but it's not a cache. It's a single level explicitly managed memory system. And it uses the concept of a, a, a memory slice or a memory bank for concurrency. In the memory system, there's a um, 88 banks, each of which can issue a read and a write. So in principle, there's up to 176 way bank level concurrency. 
that's a tremendous amount of concurrency. And we're going to describe kind of how we use that for both instruction fetching and for all the data operands and results that we're feeding to our functional units. We take really good advantage of that uh, to be able to drive our, uh, our large matrix units and vector processors at full rate. Um, so again, this is based on this deterministic latency and explicitly allocating tensors in memory hierarchy. And then we expose that, that SRAM, that 220 megabyte shared SRAM across the distributed system. So you can think of having multiples of these in a logically shared but physically distributed system, okay? At the system level, we tried to simplify some things to avoid uh, introducing a lot of complexity. For example, modern supercomputers scale to tens and 20,000, 10, 10,000, 20,000 nodes very regularly. And those are very heterogeneous systems. They often have CPUs, GPUs, smart NICs, uh, FPGAs, a variety of offload engines that are really very heterogeneous and difficult to coordinate and, and often very difficult to manage the error handling along with it, because it's often so heterogeneous, they all do something very different for the error handling. So one of the things that we did is we, we uh, build direct networks. So uh, our single chip both provides the processing elements as well as the switching elements for the networking component as well. So that single chip does both the networking and the processing. And so that, that uh, allows us to simplify our design, have fewer components, uh, as well as build very straightforward direct networks. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Direct networks, in other words, we don't have a NIC and a switch chip uh, and, uh, that, that's doing the routing. Instead, our, our single chip is doing both. So in, in one of the dis differences is, is we are literally scheduling the links. Instead of having a, a, a loosely coupled network interface where we just kind of do an RDMA request and it just goes off and works on it in the background and then notifies us when that transfer is done. Instead, we are scheduling the physical network links as a first class citizen, just like we would do the vector processor or the matrix processor, or any other on-chip resources. And this is a fundamentally different way of handling the network and handling the way that we, uh, we think of the, the overall system. Um, so again, I'll describe kind of the, the idea here, but I was really trying to get rid of some of the waste, fraud, and abuse, both at the chip level and at the system level. And one good example of this, if you were to look at this, this chip, uh, our, our chip, I'll show you a, a detailed die shot here in a moment, but the overhead for the instruction control is less than 3%. That's less than 3% for all the instruction dispatch and um, uh, the, the, what would normally be kind of the front end of your instruction dispatch pipeline. So how do we do this and why is it different? And what I thought I would do is start with kind of the canonical uh, five stage uh, pipeline that we all learned while reading Patterson and Hennessy at our mother's knee. Uh, it's got a instruction fetch, decode, execute, memory and write back. And those are the fundamental stages. And what we do is each, each one of these tiles, you can think of it, in, in, and this is just kind of a, 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 an example of a, of a many core architecture. And just to contrast our approach with, the, with this, this more, uh, more conventional approach, if you think of this as a, a collection of, of cores, what we did is we disaggregated those cores. We took the, the functional units, the integer and the floating point uh, that are your, your, your workhorses for the ALUs, right? They're doing fixed precision and, and floating point uh, numerics. And we took the instruction dispatch and we made that a separate unit unit, we made all the, the memory system a separate unit. We literally disaggregated all these units to provide a simpler instruction set for each. For example, we have a memory unit that is, is uh, the, the kind of salmon color or pink color here. The memory system only does loads and stores, gathers and scatters. That's it. It, it can do fetches instructions. It executes them. It doesn't do ads. It doesn't do transcendental functions, it just does loads and stores, gathers and scatters, along with no op and instruction fetch, obviously. Every unit has to instruction fetch. Um, so you can see what we did is we disaggregated and we made these pipelines very specific. So what we, we kind of did, if you think about, we have a separate memory unit. So we disaggregated and decoupled 
the memory access from the execution units. That is the vector units, the matrix units, the uh, switching elements that are gonna be operating on that data. This decoupled access and execute allows us to have thousands of outstanding vector references in flight and keep the memory system pipelined, heavily pipelined. And we'll talk a little bit about that as instructions get executed. Core to all this is the idea of a stream. Those streams flow on the chip. And as you can see, they flow in the east and the west direction. And this is the idea of the stream register files in that the stream register files allows us to take the what would normally be, you think about a general purpose register. And uh, if you were to think about like a, a MIPS processor and you do a load of some address into a, a general purpose register, say I store it in register two, I can come back three weeks from now and you'll still have that value in register two, unless something bad happened, you had to reset the machine. In a streaming register file, when I do a load and put it into a stream, it's moving. So the next cycle, it's going to be moving on the chip. And so as it flows on, on the chip, it's going to pass by every one of these functional units in the same way that an assembly line passes by all the different stations. As it passes by, we can pick the data up, operate on it, and then put it back into the stream so it can continue in the eastward or westward fashion. That's the very simple idea behind this concept of a stream register file and streaming stream programming that results from it. What it does is it allows us to build an efficient producer consumer model where you're producing into streams and somebody else downstream is consuming from those streams, operating on the data and producing some new value. So the chip is organized using this, uh, this concept of a super lane. As I mentioned, it's broken up into tiles, into these functional slices you can see vertically. You've got different functional units vertically and horizontally, these are different super lanes. So you can think about, we took all the normal functional units within a core and we kind of disaggregated them and spread them out across the super lane. We'll look closer at that in a moment. But what it allowed us to do then is to execute um, instructions in a cycle by cycle, kind of a staggered manner, cycle by cycle. So it's pipelined vertically in instruction execution, and it's pipelined horizontally in data execution. So this thing is pipelined in two dimensions, vertically and horizontally. So as you're thinking about this, try to imagine tensors flowing in, in kind of flowing in the horizontal dimension and instructions are being dispatched from the south to a northern way, uh, in a northern manner. This die shot shows the different functional units. I just want to take a second to point these out. At the bookends here, we've got these big MXM arrays, our matrix multiplication units. Um, and they, these are 320 by 320. So there's literally, they store 320, 320 byte size weights. So that's a total of 102,400 weights in each. And there's four instances of that on the chip. One, two, three, four. So there's over 400,000 multiply accumulates that are on the chip, and we use them to generate a 320 element fused dot product. Okay, and I'll, I'll visit that again because it's an important concept. It's a fused dot product, and then we're taking the 320 elements and computing the, the, the sum and doing a single round off. So we don't lose too much, we don't spill too much numerical uh, accuracy as a result of repeated round offs. All of this really combines to give us what, what is the goal of, of this uh, initial chip was as much compute density uh, per silicon area as we could. And that, that we hope to in turn to add value to, to our customers, right? So the goal was to expose as much computational density and communication bandwidth so that we can build scalable systems from it. In the center of the chip, we've got our vector processor, our VXM. And it sits right at the, at the center of the chip. For one reason, it has a lot of bisection bandwidth right at the center of the chip. We've got streams going east and streams going west. And so we can keep the vector processor fed completely fully, fully fed. Uh, as well as you can see along the outside of the chip is where all the IOs are. We've got a PCIe Gen 4 interface to talk to the host, a host CPU. And we've got these chip-to-chip -chip links. And these chip-to-chip -chip links are ringed around the outside of the the chip, and that's what we use for building scalable networks from. 
All right, so as instructions execute from this south to north, like I said, you can, you can kind of visualize them as having different um, little micro ops. For example, and, and I'll give this example again, we might do several things for it. For example, at time one, we're gonna read some tensor onto a screen. At time two, we might add some bias to that tensor and we're gonna flow that to uh, our SXM unit, which is our switching unit. And the SXM unit, does shifting, it does lane permutation. Think about moving the elements within the vector. And then lastly, maybe we'll install those weights in the MXM, perform a, a convolution or a mat mall. And then at time five, we're gonna take those results and write them out to memory. This shows you how we're able to kind of chain those small operations together and the conduit through which they're chained are the streaming registers. It's this, this notion of uh, a streaming register uh, is what allows us to kind of very efficiently take the output from one and chain it to the inputs of another so that we're not going back and forth to main memory. So this allows us to do kind of these more complex uh, operations with only a read and a write at the very beginning and the end of it. At the center of, of a domain-specific architecture is a domain-specific instruction set. So as I mentioned, our, our, our chip is disaggregated, disaggregated into the different functional units. And those functional units correspond to instruction control, which is the ICU, which is the, the small little sliver with constituting about 3% of the chip. If you look down here, it's literally down here in this little region down there. That is the instruction control that's dispatching uh, instructions across 144 independent instruction units on the chip. There's a memory functional unit that does, as I mentioned, reads and writes, gathers and scatters. Along with that, it has an address generation unit. And this address generation unit is a way for us to very efficiently encode very regular strided references. In other words, if you have a known access pattern uh, that looks like kind of nested loops, then you can very easily represent that with just two or three instructions to to capture the stride and that reference pattern. The vector processor does a bulk of heavy lifting. It does all the point-wise elemental operations. Uh, it, it has what you would expect of a variety of add, subtract, multiply, uh, reciprocal square root. Uh, it has activation functions such as ReLU, TANCH. Um, it also has some transcendentals as well. So uh, the MXM is the, the, the big, the big functional units that are sitting at the east and west, you know, as bookends on, on the chip. And that it, it does very little. I like to think of it as a big and dumb functional unit. It's a very big functional unit. It's very simple in that you can install weights. You can it, apply activations to it by controlling the activation buffer. And that's about it. It generates results um, uh, very, very efficiently. And it's, like I said, a very big, um, very efficient, but limited functional unit in what it's what it's doing. The SXM is our switch execution module and that does um, all the data shifting, data manipulation and movement within the vector and across vectors. So think about shifting uh, vectors north and south, permuting vectors uh, to create a bijective map or permutation map, as well as a, distribu a distribution function. So think about your communication, your communication hierarchy as I can move data within the super lane very inexpensively, but as I'm moving data further, in other words, moving data across super lanes is more expensive. Um, so there's, there's operations, for example, like rotate and transpose, which are strictly within the super lane, allows you to be very, very efficient. So you can do a, for example, a 16 by 16 transpose in just 16 cycles. So you can take 256 elements and turn it um, you know, rotate the columns and, and, and rows very, very efficiently in memory. And then lastly, we've got our chip to chip or our communication uh, links. And this, these have just a, a handful of instructions to send, receive. And then there's an, a, a unique one here that's called DSKU. And that is so that we can manage the, uh, what we call the skew across those links. And that is to keep them in a lockstep uh, manner to give the illusion of a synchronous communication fabric. Of course, with that instruction set comes a data type support. <clears throat> we support 
several of these data types natively in hardware, and I, I outlined them here in yellow, and that's int8 and uint8, as well as float16. So the big MXM units can operate uh, natively on signed and unsigned integer as well as uh, um, floating point data. <clears throat> Again, unique to this is these are eight or 16 bit uh, inputs that are accumulated as either int32 for integer arithmetic or fp32. So we're accumulating to a, a more precise, a higher, a, a larger precision than the, the inputs. <clears throat> So all of this has kind of motivated some, some interesting trends. And it really is, again, coming from that, the concept that communication and computation are two sides of the same coin. More importantly, as we see by this, this graph from Mark Horowitz's ISSC, ISSC keynote uh, several years ago, um, it's, a, it's a little bit dated, but the concepts here are so important. I just wanna, I wanna reemphasize it. Uh, and, and point out that this was, was really, I think, uh, a turning point and really embracing this data parallel approach really helped kind of move machine learning into to that realm of the new killer app for these kinds of domain specific architectures. Um, more importantly, um, there's an energy difference, a dramatic energy difference between adding 8-bit integers and adding floating point numbers, for example, or multiplying data compared to adding data. There can be an order of magnitude difference, but often a 4x or 2x difference. So you want to choose the right data type that provides the most energy efficient solution that satisfies your, your accuracy requirements. Now, remember, we're, 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 we're using these data types so that we can represent some hidden space in a, in a machine learning model, all of which is being um, characterized and representing a larger state space that, that will have some accuracy to it. And again, the idea is to, to provide the highest accuracy with the lowest precision and therefore have the best energy consumption. And this is a nice example of kind of where the energy goes. The actual energy to do that computation is off, often quite small, but the energy just accessing the register file, accessing your operands, the control unit to actually dispatch the control and do the decode is often expensive. And the actual cache access is often uh, an expensive component as well. So part of that is we have a SIMD, a SIMD um, 320 element uh, execution model so that we can amortize that control overhead across 320 elements. It allows us to, to take advantage of data parallelism where it exists and where we can efficiently use it within tensors. <clears throat> okay, so as I mentioned, the, the, the functional control units are disaggregated, but at the heart of each one of them, they all have to support several, uh, several you know, native instructions, one of which obviously is instruction fetching. They all have to fetch instructions. They all have to support a no-op. And the no-op is a special instruction here because it occupies time. It consumes one cycle. So it, it is the means by which the compiler will coordinate the, the arrival of the data and the instructions that are executing on it. As data is, is uh, flowing east and west, the instructions are flowing north. And as the two intersect, that's where the action happens. And so the instruction is executed, the data is used to, um, to process on, and we can um, use the stream registers to communicate the results between the different functional units. Um, very important here is, is two instructions for on-chip synchronization, and that's the sync and notify. The synchronization instruction allows a, uh, an, an ICU to park, so it parks the ICU, and it waits for a different ICU or from the host, either, either one, to... <clears throat> to notify or wake up all those functional units. And that's necessary because as the chip comes out of reset, all these different functional units, 144 functional units are all loosey goosey and they're all independent and, and <clears throat> they're not coordinated. So they have to be synchronized, bring them to a synchronization point. And then after we've notified, they kind of like release, release the hounds and they're all uh, in lockstep at that point. And at that moment forward, the compiler can use dead reckoning. Think about 
They know the exact location of everything and every instruction and every piece of data on the chip. And they use that dead reckoning to figure out where every piece of data is going forward. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at and punch into what this super lane looks like. As I mentioned, the super lane <clears throat> is the, the unit of kind of a, the base unit in which the chip microarchitecture is based on. A super lane, you can think about taking the functional units that are common in a mini core, uh, either the memory unit, the data movement, the network interface, the, uh, all the ALUs, and we spread them out across the super lane. And now data is going to be moving east and west on the super lane so that we can take advantage of that data flow locality as it flows past. So again, the base, the base unit here, and you can think about where we're taking our tensors, our large, uh, large, um, you know, multi-dimension tensors, and we're breaking them down into a rank two tensor. And that rank two tensor will fit on the underlying hardware here. So the inner dimension, the maximum we can do is 320 elements. The outer dimension is, is you know, nebulous. It's a, the, it, it's a streaming time. So you take the inner dimension as your vector length. The outer dimension is your streaming time. So for example, a 320 by 1024 matrix is represented by 320 element vector streamed across that for 1024 cycles. So it allows you to have two dimensions uh, in, in hardware. <clears throat> At the center of a chip is our vector processor. And the vector processor is really, it, it uses this, this 320 lane abstraction. And we, we fit 16 vector processors in each lane. So the way you can think about this is logically, we have 320 elements that are that are flowing like uh, through flowing through the chip, and we've got 16 vector processors that can intercept and use those to do various pointwise element uh, operations on them. Now, in practice, now in in that's the logical, you know, architecturally that that they're viewed as as you know, 16 kind of in the same lane, but in reality, they're organized as this kind of four by four mesh because they have to be laid out on the chip and we organize them as a four by four mesh, you can chain them all together to get this logical kind of 16 vector processors in a single lane. It provides a lot of flexibility. It is a big workhorse. It does uh, all, it supports FP32 operations as well as FP16, as well as int eight. Um, so it provides, it provides a variety of data type conversions and of course uh, all the activation functions. Uh, for example. So, so this gives a nice example of how you might map uh, a simple operation that does a, uh, um, a, an accumulation followed by an add, a ReLU, and then a, a conversion, a cast operation, and, and shows how those might be mapped to different ALUs, and all those ALUs have access to the streams. Again, the, the, that's the idea, is that the streams represent the conduit through which we can chain and share and, and be able to uh, communicate those uh, results very efficiently. Continuing with this, um, the super lane, I'm going to plunge in and, and just talk a little bit about the memory system. Now, remember, I, I mentioned that the memory system is highly concurrent, and in particular, uh, the, the memory unit is broken into two hemispheres. Each hemisphere has 44 banks of concurrency, a total of 88 banks of concurrency, and um, the reason we, we have so much memory concurrency is we have 32 streams going east, 32 streams going west, as well as all the instruction fetches and IO that we have going on. So the streams help, uh, the stream bandwidth as well as the SRAM bandwidth helps to uh, keep everything fed at full rate. And so you can see the, the um, we call these quads, not surprising, there's four, four memory banks in each one. And on each side of it, you'll see these are the different stream registers that I mentioned. And so as you load something into memory, it literally starts flowing in an east or west direction, and it starts flowing in these stream registers. So that's what I mentioned. If you do a load in a normal general purpose register, you can come back tomorrow and it'll still be there. In this architecture, if you do a load, you better have something to do with that data because it's moving. And so if you don't do anything with it, it literally is just going to fall off the end of the chip. 
So the idea here is you, you, you have to have something in mind. You're going to load some data. You're going to do something on it, and maybe you're going to store it or do something uh, beyond that. But you have to kind of think about how, how you're going to use that data. Um, the switch execution module, as I mentioned, uh, this is kind of the, the Swiss Army knife of, of data movement, and that includes uh, a distributor that allows us to very efficiently do onto mapping. So we can take, take any of the 16 bytes within the superlane, and we can rearrange them with, with utter impunity. We can just shuffle them up. Uh, we can take the transposer, and we can do um, different transpo uh, trans transpose transpositions, either one by one, four by four, or 16, uh, 16 by 16 transpose. We have a permuter and a shifter, and that permuter allows us to do an, uh, an arbitrary, uh, a bijective mapping. So to take your 320 elements and to do a bijective map. Maybe we're going to reverse them, for example, Whoop, and it allows you to flip them up ent entirely around using this, this permuter. And similarly, it has a shifter that has uh, very, very common operations to shift these tensors up or down. And you can shift in zeros, for example, the zero pads and some vectors uh, as an example. And it also has, uh, you can see the little TX and RX blocks here. These are the transmit and the receive side. And that's actually what's driving the, uh, the chip to chip links. So our chip to chip links are scheduled just like our MXM and our vector and our SXM and memory or units are. They are literally scheduled. Uh, and this is very different than, than literally uh, any other conventional CPU or GPU out there that uses a NIC that's very loosely coupled, right? You, you program up some RDMA work request and that, that's gonna cause some amount of work to be done on your behalf. So let's jump in to the system architecture. Now that we've got a little bit of our bearings about the chip architecture, Let's jump in and see how this all ties together to build scalable, robust, reliable systems at the system level. And we start by just kind of recognizing that we have to take this and package it into a packaging hierarchy. And this packaging hierarchy is really important because it's going to constrain your topology choice and your, your um, uh, how, many, how many pins you can escape, uh, for example. So, so it's really an important aspect of making your topology and your packaging nicely impedance matched. So the objectives of our topology are really multifold. We really want to have a low network diameter and we want to build a direct network. Like I said, we are going to be building the, from the same building blocks here. It's going to be our processing elements and our switching elements. It's going to be both. And we use that to build direct networks. An example of a direct network is, for example, mesh, torus, uh, uh, Latin butterfly, dragonfly. Uh, an example of an indirect network would be a full clover, or a fat tree, for example, where you've got an endpoint and you've got a switching element. Um, and then making that a packaging aware topology is really important. So what we did is, like I said, the contrast with direct networks or indirect networks where you've got routers and processors, our processors and routers are kind of commingled. And we use this um, to create a direct network that we call a software scheduled direct network. And it's a really a key, the key distinction because we're not routing packets, we're scheduling tensors on those links. <clears throat> the other thing that's very different is our um, flow control. Instead of the flow control being kind of credit based and you sense congestion and push back on the host when you overdo it, in other words, you're going to pile a bunch of things in the network and let it work its way through it until it gets congested. And then it starts to insert back pressure in the form of explicit congestion notification or ECN messages, pause frames if you're running on Ethernet. Um, and that back pressure is going to ultimately uh, hurt your performance as, as you stop, stop, uh, stop processing on the data, waiting for the the tree saturation to resolve and then starts flowing again. Instead, what we do is it, we essentially control or paste those links in software. So software knows exactly how fast we can drive those links and no faster. We can operate them up to about 96% efficiency by pushing them all the way up to that limit. Um, but going further would, would cause dropping of packets, right? So we can, we can take it all the way up to the end and of course, all of this is really fit into that packaging schema. So you can see we've taken a chip, we've combined it with a, a heat sink and mounted it on a card. And we take eight of those cards and we fit them into a node. 
And the, the, the idea here that we're trying to expose and exploit is the concept of packaging locality. Things that are close together can communicate inexpensively and abundantly. And we have literally 28 links. These are all to all. So these eight, eight TSPs are connected in a, full, in a fully connected way to each other. So if you look in here, there's 28 uh, links in these little low, low profile uh, uh, chip to chip links. And then we put a hood on it to kind of hide all the, the sausage making. And we stuff that into a rack. And that rack has a total of uh, nine nodes in it. We, we have eight nodes plus one, what we call a spare or redundant node that we can take advantage of in case we have uh, hardware failures. So the low diameter network is really important because it really drives to the first order your overall system performance. So what we want to do is be able to build as large of a network as possible with as few hops. And then what we want to do is relax that just a bit by taking one additional hop to do non-minimal routing. And by non-minimal routing, what, I'm, what I mean is if you think about you think about the network, you can take any two TSPs, any two, an arbitrary source destination pair. There's exactly one minimal route between them. But there may be many, in fact, there is many, many, uh, mul there's multiple non-minimal routes between them. So that's the, the idea here is we want to use those non-minimal routes to take advantage of all the available bisection bandwidth. So the dragonfly topology is a hierarchical topology that takes into account the packaging structure to try to match the, the packaging with the topology and create what's, what's known as a virtual router. And so we use our node to build a virtual router. That's 32 ports on each virtual router. And that allows us to be able to connect those nodes up in a, in a global system and share those across, uh, across the broader you know, distributed system. Um, so that's the idea and allows you to kind of think about this from a local topology and a global topology. Again, these are hierarchical, so they're fully connected within the local group and fully connected within the global group. The local topology here has some constraints and that it has to have a, some amount of internal speed up. So in other words, there's more internal bandwidth in the, in the local group than there is globally because we're gonna be using that local as a, as a virtual switch and we're gonna be routing some traffic through it. And then the idea here is to go from a single TSP and we can scale all the way up to uh, at the largest configuration, over 10,000 TSPs in a system. Okay, so we've got abundance amounts of both local, uh, local bandwidth and global bandwidth, and each uh, rack has a spare node in it. So that's how we kind of deal with re redundancy and reliability in a deterministic system. Remember I said, we're gonna have to make some trade-offs along the way. One of the, those trade-offs affects our redundancy and reliability. Faults and handling those faults and exceptions are notoriously non-deterministic, right? If we knew when all the faults would happen, we could account for it, but we don't. And so cables fail, power supplies fail, chips fail, and we have to have a means to, to handle that. The way that we handle that is if you're running your inference and your inference fails, the runtime system can replay it and kind of, kind of replay it once to see if the problem is kind of a persistent failure or if it's a transient failure. You might have a, a simple uh, you know, bit flip that, that is transiently resolved. Um, if, the, if there's a more permanent type of failure, replaying it doesn't fix it, then you can migrate that to a different node and, and choose a different set of nodes to run the, the application on. And this is where the topology and the symmetry of the topology matters. The dragonfly is very nicely both edge and node symmetric. Contrast that with a mesh, for example. If you had a mesh and your node and your job got laid out on that mesh, if you got if you happen to get unlucky and be on the edge of that mesh, you have less kind of ingress, you have less bandwidth than the other nodes do. So it's very nicely uh, symmetrical, and we use that to provide a a, uh, a reliability story and reliability. Uh, redundant node that we can have the runtime basically migrate and launch the job on a good set of known good hardware in the event of a failure. So how does this different than a normal, uh, a normal RDMA request? Let's just, 
think about what happens in a normal RDMA request. We start at time zero and we have our processor write to the NIC to, to describe some work request, some DMA request. And it's gonna go off and do a remote request to read some address. It's gonna send that over to the remote side where it's gonna hit the memory controller and it's gonna do some reads in the memory controller and that's gonna cause some replies to start flowing back. And those replies are gonna flow back all out across the network and then we'll finally at time five, get the data back and we'll be able to use it. So there's a very request reply protocol here in place and those protocols usually use different virtual channel buffers to guarantee deadlock freedom because it is a protocol. You can't have replies blocking requests. Um, and that's a, that's a fundamental idea. So you have virtual channels to, to, to uh, disentangle your, your requests and your reply data. Our communication model is much simpler in that the request is never sent. Instead, the, the compiler knows when the data needs to arrive and simply pushes uh, via kind of a, a send. So the destination is doing a send and the recipient is doing a receive and he's just gonna know that this data is arriving at this time and then it gets used. So, so there's no explicit request traffic flowing across the network. You can kind of think of this as just reply only traffic where the request is being implicitly communicated through metadata through the compiler, right? The compiler is, is essentially scheduling that the, the read request. So the network, as I mentioned, the network extends this concept of single chip determinism across the entire system. So we needed explicit instruction level support to support, uh, to, to, to give this illusion, right? And basically what we're doing is we've got all these TSPs that are cooperating but they might get out of sync with each other. And by, by that, I mean, these are plesiochronous links. So they, they have some tolerance and that tolerance is, is really determined by the crystal that's driving their, their, their clocks. And so if you're using a crystal with 50 parts per million, you would expect them to over a million cycles, they might drift 50 cycles or so, okay? So you can kind of think about these things as roughly in lockstep within some kind of epoch within some window but not 100% within lockstep. And we kind of, we use that to our advantage to provide the illusion of synchronous communication, even though occasionally we have to tap the brakes and make sure that everything is synchronized, okay? So instead of, inst think of it this way, if, 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 you're, if you're, your processing elements get out of sync, the first time you hit a barrier, this, you're, you're going to end up incurring a bunch of waiting time because you're going to be limited by the slowest link. And the slowest link is going to come along sometime later and he'll satisfy that barrier. Well, when they're all in lockstep, when you hit that barrier, you satisfy that barrier almost instantly. And that, that allows us to avoid all the waste, fraud, and abuse that ordinarily gets accumulated to your barrier waiting time. And that's a huge, huge benefit of, of a synchronous communication model. So I just described a little bit of here of the ISA support specifically. We have several key pieces of hardware, hard, a hardware alignment counters and a software alignment counters, as well as again, those instructions to sync, notify, de-skew. Uh, and then to be able to do this runtime de-skew. So the way that we, we structure this is, is we set up the, the, the network at the time the job is invoked, we synchronize everything, and then the runtime kind of does this periodic de-skew to make sure it's, it's still in lockstep as the, as the program executes. So every five milliseconds or so, tap the brakes, make sure everything's kosher and then proceed. And that gives you um, a, a, a very you know, amenable synchronous communication fabric that you can use uh, to, to communicate without the need of a lock. And by that, I, if you think about how you would communicate in a distributed shared memory machine, you're going to have a producer that's going to write some data. He's going to do a memory fence to make sure all that data is globally visible. And then he's going to uh, modify a flag variable that says it's now safe to consume that, that chunk. And the, the consumer is going to be busy waiting on that flag variable. And they're going to see the change in it and say, okay, I can safely consume it now. We don't require that additional lock variable. 
we're literally going to be producing data and we're going to push it out to the consumer and the consumer will know when it's visible because we use time. We have the concept of global time and the, the sender knows that at time 4,273, he's done writing the data and the receiver can now safely consume that data at the same time, 4,273 or whatever that number happens to be. So we're able to use time in a way to provide a lock-free communication fabric. And that is just critical and very different than how a distributed shared memory uh, semantics work. All right, so again, all of this is really uh, driven by our compiler and uh, um, bare metal programming interface. And there's really two, two ways of interfacing with, with the chip. Like I said, first of all, as a compiler, we're, we have an auto scaling parallelizing compiler. What does that mean? It means that you have some model, it's gonna ingest that model and it's gonna see how many parameters you have and then spread it across enough chips to be able to fit. You have to fit that model and then you're going to schedule that on the underlying hardware. We have a bare metal programming environment that allows us to have basically complete and utter control of the hardware at kind of the ISA level, at the very lowest levels if we want, to, to very explicitly control it. If you, if you don't want to operate at, Py, at PyTorch or TensorFlow, you can write these custom, custom applications using our bare metal programming interface. And then, as I said, at the bottom here, we've got this hardware software interface that's really being managed by the runtime system. So if you think about what a parallel invocation looks like, we're generating, um, we're generating multiple collateral files, multiple uh, files that need to be installed on each TSP. They need to be synchronized. And then the parallel program is invoked by the, by the runtime. And then the runtime just kind of stays plugged in to make sure that there's no exceptions. If there's an exception, the runtime has to respond to it. Right? Um, <clears throat> One of, the, one of the, the unique things about this, as I mentioned, we had to think about exceptions and how we're gonna handle that so that we can short circuit some of those. For example, how do we handle arithmetic exceptions if you get a, uh, an overflow, for example? We don't wanna have a, 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 a ALU that doesn't add, that causes an overflow that would produce a carry out flag, for example, or an overflow flag, if you're familiar with uh, other architectures. Um, instead, we choose a priori, we choose what we want the semantics to be, either saturating or modulo. And, and for example, you, know, you, you often will use saturating so that if you're, if you're doing some ALU operation, your gradients saturate at a certain point. You, they don't roll over and they don't, you, you don't overflow or underflow them. So it avoids some of, of the kind of uh, exceptions that you would have in the wild because you decide a priori how you want to handle those, those arithmetic exceptions should they arise. <clears throat> so again, the, this concept of a bare metal interface or a bare metal program is really built on layers of abstraction. At the bottom is really our assembly language, which is uh, taking, taking the, the raw instruction API and it's compiling it and producing the, the program out, the, program collateral, the object files, if you will. On top, the instruction API is what we call our tensor API. And you can think about just operating on normal tensors, like you would take tensor A and tensor B and add them or concatenate them or split them, for example. And then on top of that is a very familiar neural net library that you would see in like tfconf, you know, conf2d. We have a nn.conf2d or uh, nn.matmol or uh, average pool, for example. So there's, there's the neural network library that kind of sits on top of that. Again, the, the idea here is we want to make this an efficient target for the compiler, but obviously the compiler isn't ready on day one. So we have, we have multiple ways in which we can kind of program the chip depending on your, your use cases and depending on your application. For example, Cholesky factorization is a, is a, a high performance computing code that is very common in, in doing uh, linear algebra. And we take a symmetric positive difference matrix and we take that and we spread it across multiple chips. And then we chew through that very, in a very uh, efficient way using vector matrix math. And we can uh, get very good performance out of, the, out, of the, out of the system. And this shows you kind of how we scale across multiple TSPs. Um, ultimately, this is kind of a, 
uh, a large problem. It's an N squared kind of problem. So as the matrix grows, it becomes harder to fit onto a single chip. So we, we outgrow a single chip around 7,000 elements. So we need to start kind of spreading it across multiple chips. Um, there's other, other applications here, for example, natural language processing with BERT. Uh, this is a, a nice example. And, and just to kind of show you the, the, the benefit of determinism is <laughs> you look at our histogram of latency and it's, a, it's, it's virtually this perfectly straight spike of, of just a single value. And there's a small amount of variance because when we're reading inputs in from the host, occasionally the host can take a hiccup and, and have to replay one of those inputs. And that, that is part of the non-determinism that I mentioned earlier that, that we can't get rid of that. That's just part of PCIe and we have to kind of live with that. So we set up the chip to be able to tolerate that and be able to, to kind of manage that non-determinism interface. So we have kind of this, this well-defined interface between the host CPU and the, the TSP itself. And so we flow the inputs onto the chip. And once it's onto the chip, then we start processing and it's completely deterministic from that moment on. Uh, and we can, we can uh, execute it with, with certainty. It, it's, it's kind of an interesting observation. Um, 10 years ago, quality of service or QoS was a really sexy topic for a lot of research in, in systems architecture, uh, providing predictable quality of service and predictable service level agreements uh, was really important uh, to, to be able to build uh, scalable clusters. After all, your internet scale application will be limited to the slowest link in the network. And that's what we really wanna be able to do is provide quality of service but we do so from, from determinism. This, this concept of deterministic execution really is a great way of guaranteeing some hard quality of service limits. Um, again, let's look at GEM. And GEM is a workhorse of a lot of machine learning where we're doing matrix multiplication. And you can see that depending on the size of the matrix being multiplied, there's, there's certain kind of hardware fitting. You can think about it as, there are certain hardware characteristics that get exposed at different boundaries, right? And this is a nice example of, of looking at kind of an A100 where you see some of that hardware fitting um, taking place, right? And so one of the things that we try to do is be very resilient to that kind of hardware fitting and work across a, a wide range of, of uh, if you sweep through that matrix size, we want to be able to operate efficiently at, at all those different operating points. So this is really a sweep through those different matrix sizes, looking at how our, our matrix multiplication utilizes the, uh, the MXM at, across the, the sizes to get a sense as to how sensitive we would be to, um, to certain uh, antagonistic sizes, if you will. And then we've been making progress. As I said, you, you, you start with the compiler. We started with the compiler from, from first principles, and that informed our hardware decisions, our hardware trade-offs. And then of course, the compiler isn't done on day one when you tape out, but, but that it matures with time and the number of models and the generality of it grows. And this is a nice example of kind of that growth, uh, that growth as we're able to add more models to it, add more generality and um, be able to tackle more sophisticated models. So we're making great progress and the compiler isn't, uh, a, a wonderful way to kind of uh, get your design input into it and get it mapped to the underlying architecture. So hopefully I've kind of motivated some of the trade-offs that we made it, uh, along the way, talked about the stream programming to be able to do compute intensive deep learning and re we really bring to bear this predictable and repeatable performance. And you're probably saying to yourself, self, aren't all computers predictable in that you get the same answer over and over again? And the answer is, well, kind of. And if you just want to convince yourself of that, take, a, take an array of floating point numbers and add them up. Just take, take a million floating point numbers and add them up. And then reorder those numbers and add it up again and see if you get the same number. You won't get the same number on floating point. You'll get the same number on integer because they're associative. But floating point numbers are not associative. So um, making that both predictable and repeatable over and over again, you get the same result in the same amount of time. So it's repeatable both in space and time. And if you've ever used a system with caches, you know that I might get the same answer, 
but it might be slower the second time, depending on if I got some pollution or collateral, you know, uh, conflict, cash conflicts from another bad actor, or if there's OS interference, a variety of things kind of confound and, and intermingle in ways that collude in, 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 in ways that prevent it from being exactly predictable. So that predictability and repeatability is essential when you want to use this chip to do control systems. For example, manufacturing control systems, um, very uh, time critical latency sensitive control systems. Um, it becomes a really, really important way of managing the complexity and managing the uh, bounds on which uh, the, con the control system. And then really determinism was a means to an end to be able to bring about this vision of software defined hardware. We had to be able to make the underlying chip predictable. The compiler needs to track every piece of data as it's flowing on the chip. And that had to be a hardware and software philosophy that we had to embrace from first principles. And again, here the ISA is not about abstracting away the details, but it's really about expressing and controlling the underlying hardware. And we do that with 144 independent instruction control units. These are separate FIFOs that effectively represent your straight line code that you're executing. And these 144 instruction queues can, can consume over two terabytes per second of fetch bandwidth. So in other words, if we're keeping everything busy, we're gonna be churning through two terabytes per second of instruction bandwidth, which we have to keep fed. And that's an awful lot for a DRAM controller, but it's, it's not much to ask of our SRAM with over 60 terabytes per second of SRAM bandwidth. It's a very small fraction of the overall main memory bandwidth. And then again, we expose these architectural uh, stream registers and the, all the SRAM as well as the instruction buffers so that the compiler can completely reason about program correctness from, from beginning to end when the inputs arrive and when the outputs are generated. So we've extended this, uh, this concept of a single chip TSP determinism in that very kind of lockstep execution. We've extended that to a multiprocessor to do software scheduled networking. And really that's, and that's really where we get the value from our system approach is we're able to schedule our network links, both minimal or non-minimal to use all the bisection bandwidth in the system. And that results in really great all reduced, uh, all reduced performance. I apologize, I don't have a, a, a nice chart showing the all reduced performance. It's in the, the preprint of the paper. I'm, I'm hoping that this will inspire you to uh, attend or at least read the ISCA papers from 2020 and from uh, upcoming ISCA paper in 2022. Again, all of this was intended to uh, enable a synchronous communication model so that we can build these large scale systems and then keep the overall diameter of the network down to just a handful of microseconds so that we can make using these, these large scale systems efficient and, uh, and cost effective. I want to thank you for, uh, for enduring with me. This was a long talk, and I hope you found it useful. And I want to encourage you to reach out to the grok.com and look at our careers page and see if there's anything that's exciting to you. Um, if you want, you can grab a capture of that. That'll take you to the grok.com site. And uh, I appreciate everyone's att uh, attendance and their, uh, their attention. I'll take any questions. If you're old enough, you've seen this talk before. Um, which is not bad, which is not a bad thing, because it was a great, it's, it's a great idea every time it's come up. Um, you didn't mention a couple of things I sort of expected, um, and that was some sort of, is, is, where on your compiler chart was when you introduced some sort of virtualization so you could run a problem bigger than your system? And sort of the other question is, the, the problem with data flow is that you always run a, on the length of the longest chain. And then it's a packing problem beyond that. Um, and so, you know, conditionals are horrible. Um, mm -hmm. So if you choose your problem right, packing works perfectly, but you can't run anything. <laughs> and if you choose your problems wrong, then, you know, the, the, the packing is easy because everything's idle running no ops so where are you in, what problems are you picking so that that works out to your benefit 
Um, so I, I, if I understand the, the crux of your question here, I guess it's, it's um, you, you view this as a big two-dimensional kind of a bin packing problem. Let's see if I can go yeah. back to, you know, we, we've got this two-dimensional die that, that consists of, you know, two dimensions, right? We've got um, super lanes and, and really what we're doing is we're scheduling for the super lane yep. and then we get, we get the second dimension somewhat free, essentially free that that's the, 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 uh, the, the instruction execution execute cycle by cycle. And so that, that dimension kind of comes for free. So if you think about it, the compiler is solving kind of a, a one dimensional bin packing problem of fitting everything into that super lane kind of scheduling the functional units on that super lane rather than a more general two-dimensional bin packing problem, which is obviously more complex. Um, and so you're, you're, you're right in that you, you, have some, you have some functional data flow pipeline that you're gonna, you're gonna set up a software pipeline, right? For example, a requantization pipeline. You're gonna do some add, some multiply, a conversion, um, and then you're gonna do some, well, you start off by doing a conversion, that multiply and add in another conversion. And you're gonna set up that fixed function pipeline and you're gonna stream your tensors across it. And then you're gonna change that pipeline. And the cost of changing that pipeline differs. If you're on a CPU, you can do it on a single cycle, right? You can change instructions every cycle. If you're on a FPGA, right? You have, you have, you have a very fixed cost of setting up a diff, that pipeline. If you're on something like a coarse grain reconfigurable computer where you have some pipeline and you're going to set that up and it might take you a handful of microseconds to change that function, that becomes more expensive. What this is, is it's the programmability of a, of a processor, a GPU or a CPU, where you can change the instruction every cycle. Uh, in other words, that's why we need so much instruction fetch bandwidth. But you can change that on a cycle by cycle, and you can do it with, with, with impunity. Every cycle, you can be doing a different instruction. Um, in practice, what we, what we are trying to do is essentially we have multiple models co-resident on a chip, and you can kind of stack them all up together very efficiently so that the, they, you know, one model can, for example, you might have some object detection that feeds another model that's doing object prediction and figuring, figuring out if the, the person standing on the crosswalk is going to take a step into, the, into the, the crosswalk, for example. And so we can have multiple co-resident models on the chip that allow you to kind of very efficiently and quickly switch between them with, with, with virtually no overhead. Um, so that's one way you get at, at some, some virtualization of the hardware. But we also, we virtualize at the system level. So the way that our virtualization approach is to virtualize at the system level. Think about virtualizing up instead of virtualizing down. Instead of taking, for example, taking a GPU and breaking it into seven logical GPUs, we, we're taking a, a system of 64 TSPs and we're gonna take some subset of that and carve that out and call that a virtual cluster and we can run some application on that virtual cluster. And what we literally do then is we can turn off any of the C to C links to you know, literally physically and pr provide performance isolation and fault isolation between those little subclusters, those little virtual uh, subclusters. So the virtualization strategy is a virtualization up at the system level, rather than taking the device and breaking it into smaller parts that we try to get better utilization of the underlying hardware. I think I asked, I think I missed the problem. If I buy the smallest system from you, Mm -hmm. whatever that is. Am I limited in my problem size? It, it, it will take n times longer because I didn't give you enough money, or am I just out of luck? Do I have to buy the system for the largest problem I will ever do, or do I buy a, a system and sometimes it runs slow? That, so it's a great question. So you're asking if it doesn't fit on a single chip, can I trade off time? To, yeah, to just be able to system. kind of batch it, batch it, and bring it on in time, and yeah. and absolutely, that's that's the first step that the compiler does is basically partition kind of what's going to be running when and where. So if all you have is one TSP, obviously you 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 have to make that trade off, right? You don't have a choice. Um, but but yeah, that's that's the idea is you can bring that in in smaller chunks and work on it, and and it takes longer, obviously. Um, but if you have a system approach where you can apply more TSPs to it. And you can can take advantage of that. 
Dennis, uh, where are you in the process here? Do uh, uh, you have uh, design? Do you have uh, for silicon yet? Do you have your shipping? Uh, who's making it? Uh, what process uh, dimensions and so forth? You know, the, the, the standard um, uh, certification for uh, uh, purchase uh, agreements. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great question. So we are shipping product now. We're shipping uh, chips and nodes. Uh, we're in the process of, of building up large scale racks, multi multiple rack systems and deploying them in, the, in data centers. Um, so you can imagine that we can make this available through a virtual private server uh, and we can make, make those systems available. Um, but at the moment we are selling chips and systems up to eight way nodes. And then you can take those nodes and you can build larger scale systems from them. Um, so it is, as you mentioned, it is a, it is a journey, it is a process and we don't, you know, we don't start, uh, we don't start life with everything well baked, right? And you have to kind of work our way into that. So today we've got uh, systems with multiple racks and we're, we're working on building larger scale systems to be able to tackle truly, truly large, large scale problems. But that's a process and it takes time and it takes a maturation process for the compiler. So as you see more generality, more models, more bigger models, smaller models, multi-chip models, single chip models, uh, it's, it's all in a software maturation process and we're making great, uh, great, great strides with that. But this is something today that, that you can buy one, uh, one or more cards or you can buy a node that has eight cards in it and you can buy multiple nodes that together would be in a rack. So it depends on your use case, if it's kind of data center oriented or if it's just something that you're looking at deploying at the edge, again, at something in a, in a warehouse or at a, at a point of sale, uh, or if it's something that might be um, in situ or in, in, a, in an embedded application like an automotive uh, application. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a number of 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 kind of depending on what your use case is, um, I would say that that we are well along that kind of maturation process. It de it depends on on how how large you want to how large you want to tackle. And this is a, <clears throat> not a project a product that was built for a single customer and uh, then expanded out, or is it uh, uh, a uh, private brand that's been published public branded or what yeah so we, we're we're building this as a general it's a general purpose accelerator i mean it's general enough to tackle a variety of problems right it's not uh it's not a resnet accelerator right, right? just to make that clear um and in fact at the time when we designed the chip in 2017 uh transformers weren't uh, weren't really known and, and so um, we had to design this to be general enough to tackle a variety of different models. And uh, for example, it, it's, we designed it to be really, really efficient at matrix matrix math ve and vector matrix math. And so if you look at you know, LSTMs, RNNs, convolutional neural networks, we've designed this to be very efficient at, at doing linear algebra. And whether that's Cholesky factorization or if it's a, a BERT, uh, model that, that it's doing vector matrix operations mm -hmm. and we can do that with really efficiently and that's the that's the underlying workhorse to all of this so that's kind of what we were thinking when we designed it is to build in that generality so that it's not a one-trick pony it has to be general enough to make it very you know broadly applicable for a variety of of use cases whether it's by a fintech company oil and gas exploration or by anomaly detection for intrusion detection. There's a uh, well, I, I don't, don't want to hold you to it, but uh, can you give us a rough price uh, bracket uh, for what, what the cost of this is going to be? Or, you know, now- or I, That's a great question. I think we're, we're selling these for prices that are consistent with kind of state-of-the-art GPU. So I think um, it's, it's you know, going to be along that, that same price line. Okay. Uh, I'm, I apologize. I'm, 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 I don't have a price book or I'm not in sales, so I can't give you details on that, but I would encourage you to reach out and talk to a salesperson if, if, if that's something of interest. Um, but, but you can imagine that's it's going to be comparable to a state-of-the-art uh, GPU. Yeah. I, I will read the papers. I'm very interested. In particular, can you speak to, or is it in the paper, the bijection uh, permutator you were talking about? Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I can give a, a little more, more examples. Like I said, uh, uh, if you look at this green section here on the chip, this is our SXM. This is our switch execution module. And if you're to look at this, this is a, uh, a large on-chip network that, that is literally implemented as a, uh, a kind of a hybrid on-chip network that's a combination of folded clo and, and a Benesh switch. And what we do is we can take, uh, we take the input 320 and um, out pops the output 320 uh, permuted. So you give it a permute, permutation map. And you you mm -hmm. tell it how you want those to be rearranged. You give it an input vector and a permutation map and it pops out the output vector that matches that. And so that's just the most general, you know, Swiss army knife of data movement. You can do a lot of things with that, but that's also, that's also moving. That's, that's allowing us to move 320 elements across, you know, vertically the entire chip, right? So it's an ex relatively expensive operations. It takes tens of clock cycles to perform that. Whereas moving data within each super lane that is using the distributor, using the communication locality idea that remember I said you can do transpose and distribute and move data local to the to the super lane. And the, each super lane is 16 elements, and there's 20 super lanes, 20 times 16 is 320. Um, but you can move the, the, the bytes within the super lane with, with, with uh, you know, really, really efficiently. And, and that's kind of just this concept of locality of communication. You can uh, move, move things nearby really cheaply, but as you're moving things further, it becomes more expensive. So moving things from super lane zero to super lane 19, you can imagine is much more expensive, right? Where you've got to traverse this larger on-chip network. Mm -hmm. Is it is it a single clock operation? It is a single core clock that is driving the the entire uh, what I, what do we call kind of this core rectangle, which is just the memory, the MXM. All of that operates on a single uh, core clock that that um, uh, and the the chip to chip links obviously are running off of a a Surtees clock. So there's there's um, there's a clock domain crossing there, obviously. Um, and again, we, we had to kind of make that all work. One of the things that required us to, to, to build into the, the, the design was the chip to chip links had to use forward error correction. Remember I said the link layer protocol cannot retry things. So you don't want the replay mechanism interfering with your determinism. And so if you get a transmission error, you, you need to have a forward error correction that recognizes that that uh, that bit flip corrects it in situ and your your fixed latency pipeline remains the same so it takes the exact same time to go through it whether you had an error or not and you pop pop out at the end of it you pop out a uh, a good vector a good flip right it's corrected mm -hmm. and so that's that's the key idea we're able to kind of keep this idea of deterministic execution and build it into the data paths to make to make it all kind of hold water. You have to have this consistent philosophy throughout. The minute you put one arbiter and you can't predict where things are, poof, it all goes away. So you have to have this kind of philosophy that that really stays true to, to that. Are there people out there who have questions that uh, we are not acknowledging here? Um, I have uh, two simple questions and one um, more maybe um, difficult question. Uh, okay. The first two questions are, um, what is the power consumption and what is the heat dissipation? Okay, um, those are great questions. So the TDP here is, is, is designed for about 350 watts. Um, in practice, what we see, for example, ResNet I think is around 180, 180 watts. It's workload dependent, right? Um, so, so in practice, the, the, the actual energy consumed is far less than our, our TDP. Our TDP is designed to kind of be the worst case that we need to, to cool it and provide the provisioning for our cooling system and our packaging. Um, so it's, it's uh, the, eight, the eight TSPs in a node is about a three kilowatt uh, package. And so that's your TDP of that 4U chassis. And uh, like I said, uh, depending on the workload, it's going to consume, you know, 150 to 200, 200 and some watts typically. Thank you. My, my more difficult question is, have you 
considered potential in-ship uh, security threats? And have you thought about how you might um, control for them? Great question. Um, yeah, security, side channel attacks in particular, I'm assuming you're getting at here, if there's, if there's ways to kind of, um, to, to do side channels. One of the, one of oh, the- So no, there's two questions. One is side channel, and that's a very interesting question by itself. But because of the way um, tensor models work, um, once, they're, once they've been tested and determined to be, um, to give results within desirable ranges, people tend not to look at them again. And so one might wonder if somebody for some reason would want to change the outputs and uh, would want to interfere with the processing so as to produce consistently different results for some reason. It's a it's a great question. Let me try to let me try to answer it. So so two things. Number and one, I understand I understand this. This may be a little bit out at the edge, and and it, uh, it I'm not going to hold you to absolute. No, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a great observation. It's a great question. So a couple of things. When when we were designing the chip, and I remember if Spectre and Meltdown were were all the rage. This had just kind of uh, come out and. Um, we, they were showing how ob, you know these aggressive out of order execution can be used to essentially set up these side channel attacks, and more generally, anything that you can use and and generate different latency um, characteristics, you can create a side channel and use that varying latency to impart information. Right? In our case, the timing is all known a priori and, and anything that you would do, if you tried to, for example, if you tried to put a man in the middle attack to say inter, intercept some data, um, it would change the timing relationship. It's a little bit of the Heisenberg principle here. Once the program is built, if you try to change something, it, it's gonna uh, materially affect the outcome it, and the program simply won't behave as, as it, as it, as it should, right? It's going, I mean, the, the timing is important and you cannot perturb that timing without changing its, its result. And so it's kind of a, a Heisenberg effect. If you, put, if you put someone in the middle, it's gonna change the timing. And for example, you're gonna not intercept the data when you expect to intercept the data. So your outputs are gonna be all wrong. You're gonna get the wrong data back and you're really not gonna have observed the thing that you wanted to observe because and the, the, is part of the mechanism. So you cannot use temporal information to, to extract <laughs> information about the side channel. Question about um, the speed, the 900 megahertz. Is that in any way related to what the memory will do or can you speed it up or what's the limit that you're looking at there? Great, great question. So, so we designed a chip to, uh, in principle, operate up to a maximum frequency of, of uh, up to 1.2 gigahertz. That, that gets, a, uh, unfortunately, in, in this packaging form factor, with the amount of power that we can dissipate, we are constrained by the clock frequency to kind of keep it within that TDP. So, um, I, you know, that, that's an artifact of this is a big chip. And there is such a thing as dark silicon. If you light it all up at once, you can start it all on fire. So you don't want to do that. You have to kind of control that. And so our software is, is very instrumental in kind of smoothing out any kind of DIDT events, any transient events, so that we don't have these large spikes, these large excursionary events. And we can keep the, keep the lid on the heat and keep the lid on the on the on the uh, the performance so that or on the the heat so we don't have to throttle anything back right so we can operate at full at full band at full uh, at full rate at 900 megahertz and keep everything clicking along at that in the PCIe form factor so now as we start to build larger systems you can imagine where you have more efficient cooling techniques to be able to dissipate more heat and be able to uh, be able to do do a little bit more with that. Um, it, 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 you don't have to let your imagination run too wild to, to kind of see where that's going. Okay. 
What's the technology here, Dennis? Uh, is it uh, oh, fantastic question? This is seven nanometers uh, or what? This is actually a fourteen nanometer, uh, fourteen nanometer device. Um, you can imagine our our next generations are going to be uh, smaller feature sizes, but this is actually a fourteen nanometer device, and um, we we uh, we're we're quite happy that we're we're getting such uh, great results with this and competing with um, you know truly much more dense node sizes, much more uh, ambitious node sizes in, in competitive products. Okay. Uh, I, I'm from Slack. I, I do a lot of FPGA development. Now, it's a fairly practical question here, is you've tied the, uh, the compiler and the hardware together fairly tightly. So I'm interested in sort of what the development cycle looks like. Is this like an FPGA when I go to compile, I'm looking at a fairly long cycle to do this and what happens uh, do I have to describe the chip that I'm going to to the compiler in detail, like you would an FPGA? Fantastic question. Um, great question. So, so the compilation is, is uh, unlike an FPGA where you're you're essentially ingesting Verilog and you're you're doing going through a place and route. That is a much. This is a much much uh, faster process. For example, it's a hand, it's literally a handful of minutes to compile ResNet, for example or BERT, BERT large. So it's, it's, a, it's a handful of minutes and it's getting better all the time. Um, so it's, it's much more efficient than what you're probably accustomed to for place and route and tool chains. In fact, that's one of the things we are really looking at doing is increasing the, the, the iteration rate. It, that the compile time has to be low enough so that you can experiment. And in fact, you don't need any hardware at all to compile to get your to know exactly what performance it's going to run, and to even get some estimates as to what power it's going to take, and so you can run the compiler and without any hardware attached to it at all, just to get to, to iterate quickly on your model and get the the compilation you know step done entirely. With that, you 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 do choose your target, right? You do you want a single chip? What does that? Uh, what there's a topology, uh, you know, specification that says what the network is that that describes the the TSPs underneath that you're targeting. And that's but that's a you know very lightweight and it's set up kind of ahead of time and and you're just compiling your code and and the compiler is going to ingest that, look at how many uh, TSPs it it has to spread it across to fit and from a capacity standpoint. Um, obviously, you have to have that many TSPs in the system um, to, to, to be able to, to actually execute it then. But importantly, you don't need actual underlying hardware in order to just kind of compile and test out your, your machine learning model. And that's really key, is that the, the time to iteration is the time to innovation. And just being able to iterate quickly allows you to try some things out, to, 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 to be able to iterate quickly, build, test, and learn very quickly. Uh, before you even install it on a piece of hardware. Okay, so as you move forward in your hardware, you will have to sort of recompile your program. And I'm just thinking of like your, your chip will evolve at, at, on a roadmap. It may have different that, architectural features. That's right. So as we add to the second generation, as we add different functional units, as we add more, uh, more compute or we add more communication, mm -hmm. The chip, the, the chip organization will change. And that's that's just kind of an internal, you know, internal between the compiler and the underlying hardware. That's kind of that hardware software agreement. And that will change, but but yes, it will entail recompiling. Um, and and that's the that's you know, it, we we thought about having kind of binary compatibility, and it just, it just didn't make sense to kind of make things backwardly compatible, and especially with these models, if you can compile quickly. And make that as painless as possible, then it's just not as big of a deal. Yeah. So, so your market is is more or less people with dedicated pro dedicated things, not somebody who has a library of a thousand different applications. Well, a thousand different applications are great, but you, I think we have to tackle them one at a time. Is the point, right? It, it, this isn't a, a kind of a kernel a kernel based approach, right? We don't. It's not like a GPU where we have a kernel for you know image to call or a kernel that does whatever X, Y, or Z. Instead, we have the parallelizing compiler that is a vectorizing compiler, and it's going to, from first principles, take this disaggregated processor and map your problem to these functional units. And that's a it's a it's a little different approach than kind of kernel based, just 
taking a bunch of kernels and throwing it at, at, at the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're coming up to the end here. Are there any more questions? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for giving us the talk today. Um, I had one question on the C2C links. Uh, so you mentioned forward error correction. I was wondering if there's a significant penalty due to the added latency with the forward error correction and how you take that into account. It's a fantastic question. So forward error correction is, um, you know, compulsorily, it does take some time, right? And it's it's on the order of hundreds of nanoseconds, probably uh, like 100 to 200 nanoseconds. So it does increase the latency of per hop latency. However, we can, you know, deal with the added latency. We can have everything pipelined and we can hide that latency very nicely, but it does make each link slightly longer from a input late, you know, from a flit in to flit out, uh, it does lengthen it a bit. And so that is one of the trade-offs of, of forward error correction in, in, in poses, um, you know, and, and going forward, especially as we get to 112 and 224 gigabit per second signaling, forward error correction is, is absolutely compulsory on these, on these channels, right? And so you're, we're gonna have to kind of it's a difficult pill to swallow, all that additional latency for the Reed Solomon encoding, but we have to do that to just to 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 make these reliable at scale. That's a great question. We do have to pay the latency. The good news is we can hide all that latency uh, and keep everything fully pipelined. Hi again. Um, what is your compiler written in? Is and do you have a formal specification, a proof verified, or you know? Is it written in C? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Um, so parts of the compiler are written in Haskell and parts are written in C++. And, and I, I would say parts of it, uh, I, I, I don't want to speak to the formal verif verifiability of, of it. Obviously, Haskell is, is strongly typed and there's a, a lot of, uh, of uh, type safety that goes into that. Um, so parts of the compiler are strategically written in Haskell, parts are written in C++. Okay, I have sort of the penultimate question then, and that is, what do you do for the next chip? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Well, I don't want to, any spoiler alerts here, I, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin our, our, uh, our surprises <laughs> for the next chip. Um, but not surprisingly, you will probably see more uh, more compute uh, throughput, uh, and and really, I, I hope to to take advantage of something that we're uniquely capable of of taking advantage of, and that is this concept of energy proportionality. And that's very it's a twenty dollar word that just simply means if you're doing very little, you should consume very little energy, and as you do incre incrementally more, you want to consume incrementally more energy. And that seems like, well, that's kind of obvious, Dennis. Why aren't all systems energy proportional? And if you think about the way a modern multi-chip core is organized, you've got a shared memory hierarchy, you've got multiple cores, and the moment you turn on one core, you have to turn on all the shared parts, the L1 cache, the L2 cache, the L3 cache, the memory controller, all the networking ports. You need to fire everything up. So it's not terribly proportional. As soon as you're doing 10%, as soon as you have 10% offered load, you're consuming 40% of your energy because you have turned up all these shared things on. And that is fundamentally what we would, should be moving away from. We want to be really good stewards of, of our planet's energy, protect our, our data center's PUE, our, our energy efficiency at the, at the data center level. And we want to be good stewards of our, of our customers' data and their, and their, their electric bill. Right, so energy proportionality is going to be key as we go forward, and this is a, a, a architecture that is uniquely suited to be able to make that a very incremental and energy proportional endeavor without those kind of large, clunky, non-uniform uh, energy consumptions. Um, so, as as you can imagine, um, the number of lanes that we're using is a very good heuristic as to the arithmetic intensity required. For example, if you were to look at ResNet, the first layer of ResNet is 224 by 224 by 3 for the, for the tensor dimensions. And as you go into the deeper layers, it gets 
smaller, it goes from 224 by 224 to 112 by 112 by 64, for example. The tensors are getting smaller spatially, but they're getting deeper, okay? And so while the, the, the tensor shape is changing, your vector length is, is changing with it. So for example, you might start off using 224 of the 320 elements, but on the next uh, layer, you're using a smaller fraction of them, say 112. And so we want to consume energy that's proportional to the amount of valid vector lanes that we're using. And so you can kind of very simply see that this is a very amenable architecture for that kind of approach. Okay, we have chance for one more question and then we'll have to call it quits. Otherwise we'll say thank you and uh, go out. Is there another question? You've uh, answered everybody's uh, questions. So that's, that's what happens, you know. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great ship. And you guys have done a super job, it looks like. And um, I'm uh, just really pleased that uh, it's out and uh, people are beginning to work with it. And uh, I know that pleasure. there's a lot of uh, interesting problems out there you'll be able to work on. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. It was my pleasure.